Um, I think this is around the point where I stop marking things that were callbacks and reuse material. <laughs> I, at first I'm like, oh, see, he's bringing it around. And then, oh, he's bringing that around. To okay, there's no... Okay. <laughs> I just... At that point, I'm just like, oh, I get what's happening here. This is all callbacks. So let, let's, <laughs> let's pick up with... That um, chapter 8, I guess we want to call it. Um, and he's been talking about how the God Word, as he repeatedly calls it, the God Word brought everything into existence and doesn't want to let anything die and such. And he says, I've got almost the whole page highlighted, but I don't want to talk about the whole page. Well, I do, but... I know I can't. Um, the top of page 57, the second sentence. For seeing the rational race <clears throat> perishing and death reigning over them through corruption and seeing also the threat of transgression giving firm hold to the corruption was, which was upon us and that it was absurd for the law to be dissolved before being fulfilled and seeing the impropriety in what had happened. There's those two ideas there of the absurdity and the impropriety of what had happened in the fall, that the very things of which he himself was the creator were disappearing, that's what was improper, and seeing the excessive wickedness of human beings, that they gradually increased it to an intolerable pitch against themselves, and seeing the liability of all human beings to death, why were they all liable to death? Because they were in sin. Or... Okay, yes, because they're mortal. He says... Because they turned away, but also because they were brought out of nothing into existence, and only while they had the knowledge of God were they immortal. Once they turned away from the knowledge of God, then their natural existence took back control, and it was only natural, therefore, that they should die. Seeing the liability of all human beings to death, having mercy upon our race, and having pity upon our weakness, and condescending to our corruption... And not enduring the dominion of it, condescending to our corruption, that is, reaching down or stooping down to take on human form, right? And not enduring the dominion of death, the God word did not endure the dominion of death. Why? Because he is life himself, St. Athanasius says. Lest what had been created should perish, and the work of the Father himself for human beings should be in vain, he takes for himself a body, and that not foreign to our own. Now he's going to take up this idea quite a bit later on in talking about the Gentiles. Okay, So he takes for himself a body and that not foreign to our own. That is, he takes a human body. He doesn't take a you know, body of a horse and an eagle together or something like that. Or no. Like the body of, you know, like Titan. Or, or a body of a Titan, a god, you know, that kind of thing. Exactly. No, he takes that which is ours, humanity, human flesh, and that not simply, but from a spotless and stainless virgin, ignorant of man, pure and unmixed from intercourse with men. Okay, And that not simply means, he's also addressing a heresy here, and I'm trying to remember the adoptionist heresy, which is that what St. Athanasius is saying is that he doesn't take any old human individual who had been born in the normal human way. Okay, No, he takes it how? From a spotless and stainless virgin, ignorant of man, pure and unmixed from the intercourse with men. In other words, he does something that hasn't been done before. Okay, the virgin birth. And thus, skipping out of the line, taking from ours that which is like, that is, flesh. Real, actual, human flesh, not some kind of docetic apparition, um, that which is like, since all were liable to the corruption of death, delivering it over to death on behalf of all, that is, what is delivered over to death on behalf of all? The actual body, all right? He offered it to the Father. So he takes the body, the body dies, he offers it to the Father, doing this in his love for human beings so that, on the one hand, with all dying in him, okay, St. Paul says, in that one man sinned, 
all sinned in that one man was made perfect, all were made perfect, with all dying in him, the law concerning corruption in human beings might be undone. Or, another way of putting it, fulfilled. The requirements were met, so to speak. Its power being fully expended in the lordly body and no longer having any ground against similar. That is, the law was such, St. Athanasius doesn't go through and, and entirely explain this, but this is what it means. The law was such that if one should fulfill it, it would be fulfilled for all. All it took was one of human flesh to fulfill it. And, on the other hand, that as human beings had turned towards corruption, he might turn them again to incorruptibility. How? By regaining for them the knowledge of God and give them life from death. From, give them life from death. How? By making the body his own and by the grace of the resurrection, banishing death from them as straw from the fire. Okay. Chapter 9. For the word, realizing that in no other way would the corruption of human beings be undone except simply by dying, yet being immortal in the Son of the Father, the word was not able to die. Okay, so notice that. The corruption of human beings would not be undone by any other way except by dying. But because he was immortal in the Son of the Father, the word was not able to die. For this reason, he takes to himself a body capable of death. That is, even though he himself, inhabiting the body, doesn't die, the soul doesn't die, the body dies, in order that it, that is the body, participating in the word, who is above all, might be sufficient for death on behalf of all. Because what happens to the death of the word in body after three days? Rises again. Why? Because death cannot keep life down. And this is all the first paragraph, chapter 9. That's just some of my... Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I was... Uh, ignore me. I'm trying to remember that. I'm just trying to... I remember this thing that was in here. Okay. Sure was. Um, that the word is above all might be sufficient for death on behalf of all, and through the indwelling word would remain incorruptible. And so corruption might henceforth cease from all by the grace of the resurrection. Skip another line. For being above all the word of God, consequently, by offering his own temple and his bodily instrument as a substitute for all, he fulfilled, I'm throwing in that he, fulfilled in death that which was required. And being with all through the light, that is, being with all humanity, okay, through the body, the incorruptible Son of God consequently clothed all, with incorruptibility in the promise concerning the resurrection. That is, all are incorruptible. All will be resurrected. And that's why Christ says you'll be resurrected to either the resurrection of the righteous or the resurrection of the damned. But everybody will be resurrected. Nobody will be, as many of the Greeks taught, dissolved into nothing. There will be no nothingness afterwards. Why? Because the word came down, took flesh, and because of that, all flesh, all human flesh, is now incorruptible. Okay? He goes on in chapter 10, talks about how this uh, befitted the goodness of God, etc., for his honor. And then he says, top of page 59, um, The God word of the all-good Father did not neglect the race of human beings created by himself, which was going to corruption. But he blotted out the death which had occurred through the offering of his own body, and correcting their carelessness by his own teaching, restoring every aspect of human beings by his own power. Okay, Restoring every aspect. That is, there's not an iota, so to speak, of human nature that is not restored. Now, it sounds very um, universal, um, not so much in specifics, but in, in just the language he's using, it sounds very much like a worldwide, like, single, you know, it is. resurrection of, of human beings, but 
obviously the, the the church fathers believed there was you know, obviously some sort of uh, benefit to there was there was a purpose in becoming a Christian, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, he's not talking here at all about final judgment, mm -hmm. which comes after the resurrection. Okay. So all are, according to the fathers of the church, all are resurrected. Okay, right. Some are resurrected to life. Some are resurrected to death. Okay. And that's why, you know, Christ says, don't worry about death. You know, fear the second death and fear the one who can destroy. Okay. But even there, I mean, the whole, the whole idea of the threat behind hell is that it is a place of not only spiritual, but physical kind of torment. Because even those who are resurrected to death will remain in the body. That's why it's, you know, it's called an everlasting death. It's an everlasting consumption, like the burning bush. It's burned, but it's not consumed. So the pains of hell, so to speak, are burning, if you want, but never being consumed. Okay? So what, what he's talking about solely at this point is the word... The word is made flesh so that all flesh doesn't need to fear death. All flesh can be and will be resurrected okay. from death. So death doesn't have the final say. So we're not so much talking about atonement. Here, then. No, um, no, not necessarily. Okay. Um, so he goes on. Uh, right there in the middle of 59. <clears throat> then he, talking about Christ, also point, uh, actually, um, Paul, he also points out the reason why it was necessary for, another, for none other than the word, than the God word, to be incarnate, saying, for it was fitting that he, for whom, all, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Okay. Saying this, he means that it was for none other to bring human beings out from the corruption that had occurred, except the God word who had also created them in the beginning. So if you want, you could say, Gregory, yeah, this does kind of talk about atonement, but it's the first stage, let's say. And this is going back to the, the, the beginning and the reason for the God word taking on Human flesh was to redeem all of humanity from corruption. Well, the first part of that act of redemption is to prepare them, let's say, for the resurrection. Right. Okay, so it's to make the human flesh incorruptible ultimately. Okay, and to give them the knowledge of God. Go down to the bottom of that page after that that last quote from Hebrews. For by the sacrifice of his own body, he both put an end to the law, lying against us, okay, and renewed for us the source of life, giving hope of the resurrection. That is, the law was fulfilled, the law has been met, so it no longer, as he puts it, lies against us. It no longer, you know, uh, has power over us, and renewed the source of life himself, okay, giving hope of the resurrection. Now, obviously, I think St. Athanasius is implying the only way you have hope of the resurrection is what? If you're hoping for a positive resurrection. Right. Okay. Nobody, nobody hopes. Exactly. Resurrection. Exactly. Okay. So top of page 60. Um, actually, let me go back down to bottom of 59 after that. Sentence I've read. For since through human beings death had seized human beings, for this reason again, through the incarnation of the God Word, there occurred the dissolution of death and the resurrection of life. O death, where is thy victory? O grave, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thy sting, O death, where is thy victory? As the Christ bearing man says, For as by a human being came death, by a human being has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, so in Christ shall all be made alive, people like George MacDonald take that to mean right. all should be made alive, meaning resurrected to heaven, ultimately. 
I guess okay. from Jordan Jaws' perspective, Adam Sin, the <laughs> the corruption of Adam Sin wasn't so much a physical one as it was a spiritual one, and so they couldn't be speaking of, you know. No, I think McDonald would actually say it's both, but but for McDonald, um, God's love is the is the only constant in in the universe. And nothing can overcome God's love. Well, what does nothing mean? Nothing. Not even your own, not even your own stubbornness. Not even your own stubbornness can ultimately overcome God's love because that makes your own stubbornness what? Stronger than God. Not even Satan's stubbornness can overcome God's love because that means Satan becomes then therefore stronger than God. Okay. So ultimately, it's kind of sort of interesting sort of quasi Calvinist theology there, isn't it? it because it, it's sort of like it's sort of taking Calvinism but removing the main difficulty of Calvinism, which is if God yeah, is kind in of the business of just going bling, I see what you mean. Bling everybody. Um. So he says at the end of that section, this is the first cause of the incarnation. Okay, the first cause of the incarnation is to restore corruptible humans to incorruptibility. He hasn't even gotten to the whole knowledge in in grace of God there, okay? So that way, that's where you get to the second dilemma, the divine dilemma regarding knowledge and ignorance, okay? So about halfway in that paragraph of chapter 11 on page 60, he did not leave them destitute of the knowledge of himself, lest their being should be profitless. Or we might translate that, and I understand why he uses profitless, we might translate that pointless. No, no end, no purpose. Profitless, however, meaning, however, means that they would have no reward. This and the idea is that knowledge of God will lead to reward. Okay? Not reward in the sense of, oh, good person, here's a gold star kind of a thing. For what would profit, excuse me, for what profit would there be for those who were made if they did not know their own maker? In other words, what good would it be for them if they didn't know their own maker? Or how would they be rational, not knowing the word of the Father in whom they came to be? And you have that wonderful line, I think I mentioned it the other day in class, in uh, Paradise Lost, when Satan says to one of the angels, you know, there never was a time when I was not, you know, because I do not rem remember when I was not, okay? Showing by that very logic, the ill logic of his position, okay? Why would God have made those by whom he did not wish to be made known? I mean, this is a rational question. Why would God make those that he did not wish to be known by? Okay. So, if I'm understanding correctly, is that awareness, we're, we're clearly capable of awareness, so why would the Christ act or the word God anonymously just randomly die in a jungle somewhere around no one, and everything's done, but or, we're unaware of it. Or, following the deist's logic, why would he wind, Why would he create the watch, wind it up, throw it off in space, and then completely turn his back and not have anything to do with with what was made? Yeah. He's he's saying that's illogical. Yeah. And this is he meant to like imply kind of arrogance, like. Like, what's he implying? Because, like, if you make something, it's almost like you want to credit for it and be like, hey, I made you, therefore you bowed on to me. So is it kind of, like, not saying God's arrogant, but it kind of, um, like, he... I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, I don't think, I don't know that he's saying that it's arrogance. I think that it's, you know, what he's going to get to is we were made rationally. We were made to understand. Okay, so in him... Like showing himself to us, it makes us behave more rationally rather than in, him being. Well, not only does it make us behave more rationally, but enables it enables us to see the source of our rationality. Because if you've, for example, if you've ever read C.S. Lewis's *Mere Christianity*, you know one of the things he does in *Mere Christianity* towards the beginning is he raises the whole question of thought and morality, you know, and. Lewis, and not just Lewis, a lot of others, in fact, in, including a 
couple of pretty major atheists in the middle part of the 20th century who later became theists and then later became Catholic who, who said, you know, to argue that evolution comes up with thought and thought about why we exist and where we come from is illogical because it cannot answer those kinds of questions. To answer those kinds of questions, you have to come up with a, an ultimate source of thought that is outside. So we're sort of talking about Alvin Planting as, um, Alvin Planting of... I know who he is. I'm not writing any of his stuff. Uh, well, he, he kind of reported this idea that, you know, basically evolution, you know, if, if you were, like, the example I think he gives is like, you know, evolutionarily, if you're faced with a predator, like a tiger, you know, he, evolution needs to get you to run away from the tiger, right? But it doesn't need to tell you that the tiger is dangerous, right? What, what happens in your head could be, oh, the tiger loves me and wants to hug me. So long as your physical reaction to that belief is that you run the other way. Yeah. <laughs> and so ultimately evolution can't produce rational thought because the thoughts are not relevant to survival. Right. <laughs> right. And that's why he, he says, look at the end of that chapter, just before chapter 12. Everything was completely full of impiety and lawlessness. And neither God nor his word was recognized. Okay? In other words, the implication is because God and his word weren't recognized, what was the result? The lawlessness and impiety. All right? It's kind of a, a, a classical truism of the church that, that everything that is not from God is ultimately illogical and irrational. You know? Satan's very act, we could say, is the, the ultimate act of irrationality for a creature to say, I will be above the most high. You know, well, what's the most high Im imply? You know, here's God, and here is this huge gap. Because God is uncreated, and then everything down here is created, including su uh, Satan, right? And between here and here is, is whatever you call this, okay? So that even in the 1960s, when a guy named John A.T. Robinson, who was one of the big leaders of the Death of God movement, okay, um, you know, he redefined God, essentially. And he just simply said, God is the ground of all things, okay? And I kind of think, I used to be really, really harsh against him back when I was truly reformed. I kind of think that he wasn't saying there is no God, but he was saying God is so far beyond what we think that we've got to stop using the word God lightly and flippantly. And we have to understand that totally foreign and other from us, okay? So that when Satan then goes, uh, I want to be higher than you, what is he saying? I want to be self-existent. Well, how's that going to work? Being as he was brought into existence, how do you then go back to become not into existence, and then when you're not in existence, you suddenly go, uh, I shall be. I shall be, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ego... <laughs> what? <laughs> Ego possumus? I shall be something like that. My Latin's pretty bad. So, neither God nor his word was recognized, even though he had not hidden himself invisibly from human beings, nor given them knowledge of himself in one way only, but had enfolded it to them in manifold ways and through many forms. Well, what are the manifold ways and many forms? Nature itself, the heavens declare the glory of God, the psalmist says. Okay? Yeah. And kind of going back to, I think what he's talking about, if I have this wrong, um, is, I'm trying to think of a nice way of putting it, is God is putting on a show. And he's putting on a show that people will necessarily talk about because in lieu of that, humans are just going to wander. And so it's like, here's something 
on the cross, resurrection, this will be talked about, you will remember it, because if I don't do that, you'll just scatter. So he's saying these choices are made, this is why, you know, he's not dying of illness in a hut, it's a very public, it's a very public display, because without that, and it's not the only one. I mean, go back to the Old Testament, and what do you see? You see from the beginning, okay, the, the quote-unquote messianic prophecies, but then you also see image after image after image after image that is a type of that image. So you have, you know, Moses over the Red Sea, and what does he do? He holds his staff up. Well, he holds his staff up, and his arm and the staff make essentially a cross, all right? Yeah, you don't have the little headpiece over it, but you have the arm, and you have the staff, okay, and you've got the T there, at least, part of the cross. And numerous other images like that. So, you know, he uses all of these images to kind of slap people across the face and say, wake up, look, I'm not gone, I haven't left. I mean, look at the language there again. He had not hidden himself invisibly from human beings. Okay, that's the deist God. The deist God cannot be known. So that even though Thomas Jefferson writes, you know, we have these inalienable, inalienable rights, and among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we cannot know that for truth because we can have no experience of the God who gave those rights, according to Jefferson's deistic beliefs, because he doesn't care. All right? I mean, that's... Pretty radical when you when you realize when you put Jefferson's deistic beliefs alongside the Declaration, of, it turns the Declaration of Independence into a very different idea than when the Declaration of Independence is put on a wall, like in a library, classroom, or building, or whatever, and it goes all the way back to the Ten Commandments. It goes all the way up, okay? Because according to, to Jefferson, Ten Commandments have nothing to do whatsoever with the Declaration of Independence, all right? So he goes on. The grace of being in the image was sufficient to know the God word and through him the Father. The grace of being in the image of God, that is, in the image of God, was enough for people to know God exists. But he says, knowing human weakness... What did God do? He made it so that they would know through the works of creation that they might not be ignorant of their creator. Okay? It's to the extent that, you know, even today we have astronauts and molecular biologists and chemists who say, there's no way. There's no flipping way. This is merely the product of time plus chance, plus equals, you know, for example, Einstein. It doesn't happen, you know. Put a, what's the old adage? Put a thousand monkeys in a, yeah. in a room with, a type, with typewriters, Take let them type them. for a million years, you never come out with the works of Shakespeare. Oh. You put, you put um, the infinite number of monkeys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that uh, Terry Pratchett? I think who does that. Okay, so goes on page sixty-two. Uh, God anticipated their weakness. So what did He do? He made it so that if they shrank from looking up to the heavens and knowing the Creator, they might have instructions from those close by. For human beings are able to learn from humans more directly about higher things. Kind of, you know, natural. So, they could, lifting up their sight to the greatness of the heaven, discerning the harmony of creation, know its ruler, and by this know, uh, I don't have this passage highlighted, but I want to do it. And by this know that for this reason moves the universe so that through him all might know God. Skip a few lines. For the law was not only for the Jews. See, this is what the Jews thought. It was only for them. Nor on their account only were the prophets sent. The Jews thought they were only for them. They were sent to the Jews 
and persecuted by the Jews, but they were for the whole inhabited world. A sacred school of the knowledge of God and the conduct of the soul. In other words, the prophets aren't just for understanding God. They're for understanding ourselves and how to direct the soul, how to attain to the knowledge of God. Since then, chapter 13, human beings had become, notice this, so irrational. And demonic deceit was thus overshadowing every place and hiding the true knowledge, or hiding the knowledge of true God. What was God to do? Is God just going to say, eh, start over? Is he just going to wipe the slate clean? Is he just going to say, mm, I'll just go somewhere else and do something else? Be silent before such things and let human beings be deceived by the demons and be ignorant of God. Well, if he does that, then who wins? The demons. But then what need was there in the beginning for human beings to come into being in the image of God? In other words, but they already exist. Okay, it's kind of an infinite loop. You keep going back to before anything is even made, humans are made in the image of God. So, what need at all was there for him to receive a notion about God from the beginning? That is, for Adam to receive a notion about God from the beginning. Yeah. Now, what, what's Ignatius's, um, like, how does, how does he see this, this idea of rationality? Um, that was something that I was... Wait, say that again? How, how, how like, I'm, I'm sort of having a hard time pulling out this idea of rationality. That's Ignatius, that's Ignatius. Um, like, what, um, like, what, what, what does he mean by rational? Um, Reasonable man. Logical man. Okay. Thinking man. So, so it's what makes what us. We would think of, right? Yeah, which it separates us from the animal world. Okay. Um, in fact, he goes on. Look at page 63, that second paragraph, about five lines down. How much more will God allow his own creatures to not be led astray from him and serve things that do not exist? Okay, what are the things that do not exist? Idolatry. Idolatry, false gods. In particular, since such error is the cause of their destruction and disappearance, that is, their death, it was not right that those who had once partaken of the image of God should be destroyed. What does he mean? God doesn't wish, God doesn't desire, that those who bear his image should ever die, should ever be destroyed. What then was God to do? And when he asked that, what then was God to do? You get this impression that he's saying, oh dear, God's sitting there in heaven go, oh, what am I, whatever am I going to do? Or what should be done except to renew again the in the image? Well, what's the in the image? Adam, Eve, Cain, all, Enoch, Methuselah, David, Matthew, Christ. All the way down to us today. So that through it, that is, the image, human beings would be able once again to know him. So how is he going to renew again the in the image? Not a do-over, okay, but by doing what? Having a new image. It's the same image. Polishing the mirror. Or, another way of putting it, a newly made mirror. Yeah. But one that doesn't have silver on the back, <laughs> but one that is a true mirror. It has the mirror, it has, for lack of a better phrase, mirrorness in it. Okay. The essence of mirror. <laughs> it has the very essence of mirror. So the new image has what? The truth of God. The word God, the God word, all right? So he goes on and talks about, you know, what happens, you know, at the bottom of page 63, when you have a figure painted on wood that has dirt on it. What do you do? You clean the image off. Notice what he's saying about the image. It isn't obliterated. Just tarnished. It's just tarnished. This is a big distinction between Athanasius and, for example, Calvin. The image is not totally depraved, in other words, 
Okay, it's just dirty. It needs a good bath, a good scrubbing. So, page 64, a couple, couple lines down. Since the madness of idolatry and godlessness held firm the inhabited world, of God was hidden, whose was it to teach the inhabited world of the Father? Meaning, whose job? Somebody has to. In the image. In other words, the person to come teach this knowledge of God could not could not be a, an ET. Okay? Because what would that individual then be taken as? God. But that's not what God wants. Because what does God want? God wants the people to see they are in the image of God. That they have the image of God. Okay? So, a human being. But humans were not able to traverse under the sun. Nor by nature were they able to run so far. Nor were they sufficient to become credible regarding this. Nor were they able by themselves to withstand the deceit of the demons. For everyone was smitten, etc. So, skip down to the end of that page. Rightly wishing to help human beings, he sojourned as a human being. Rightly wishing to help human beings, he what? He walked as a human being. This is, you know, one of the differences between Christianity and all other religions. He became one of us. All right? In Islam, Allah does not become Muhammad. Muhammad is just a prophet. Okay? He's the last of the prophets. Christ is a prophet also. Christ is not the Son of God. For them, that's blasphemy. Rightly wishing to help human beings, he sojourned as a human being, taking to himself a body like theirs and from below. From below mean? This isn't a body made in heaven that, you know, he, he's not, you know, uh, he's not like uh, Loki in the Avengers, you know, who comes to and says, I'm a god. No. He not only takes a body like theirs and from below, but how? I mean, works of the body. Physically born. All right? Umbilical cord, belly button. It's not, he's born magically. He, you know, they go to the stable and Mary prays and boom, he's there. No. I mean through the works of the body. That those not wishing to know him from his providence and governance of the universe, that is those who, who don't want to think about that aspect, no. But from the works done through the body might know the word of God in the body and through him the Father. Which is why... Christ, you know, says, even if you don't believe what I say, what do the works I do show? Who in the past has raised the dead? Well, Elisha did. Okay, so that's not totally new. It's mostly new, but not totally new. But who has cured somebody blind from birth? Uh, he's going to talk about that later. That's never been done before. Or someone who is lame from birth. Or someone who is deaf from birth. Or someone who is mute from birth. Never happened. All right? For as a good teacher who cares for his students, always condescends to teach by simpler means those who are unable, not able to benefit from more advanced things, so also does the word of God. Now, think about that for a minute. What is Athanasius saying? Because he's having to simplify the message to scoop down to a level of human comprehension. Exactly. God is saying, okay, well, they're not all that bright. So let me make it easy for them. <laughs> yeah. It comes down and becomes one of us not so bright. All right? That's like... Uh, 
for humans, like on page 62, where he says, for human beings are able to learn from humans more directly about higher things. You know, or um, the, hem- the moment I read that, I thought of that really annoying thing that plays during Christmas with the guy. In the- did, did, you ever, did you ever listen to the radio during Christmas where there's that guy? I seldom listen to the radio, period. Oh. <laughs> Do you know the story of the, the birds? Yes. Yes, there's this there's this thing where a guy's like he's just like can't go to church on Christmas but just don't get you know what the this whole this whole God becoming man thing you know and it's 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 literally like in language like that but okay. it's, he's, it's but but he he starts trying to get all these birds out of the storm and into this barn you know? okay. like oh no and then he immediately goes if only I could become a bird and then immediately. Okay. <laughs> so the good teacher does what? As Paul says, in, since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, what? It pleased God through the folly of the preaching to save those who believe. Well, what's the folly of the preaching? What did God do to save those who believe? Became man. That's the folly of the preaching to Greeks, right? So, for this reason, the lover of human beings, that word there is philanthropos. It's where we get the word philanthropy. Okay. The lover of human beings and the common savior of all takes to himself a body and dwells as human among humans, draws to himself, what? The perceptible senses of all human beings. What does that mean? The five senses. They can see him. They can hear him. They can taste him. They can touch him. Okay. What else? I'm missing something. They can smell him. They can smell him. Probably, especially after he's walking, you know, up and down the length and breadth of Israel without a shower. And draws to himself the perceptible senses of all human beings so that those who think that God is in things corporeal might, from what the Lord wrought through the action of the body, know the truth and through him might consider the Father. Those who think that God is in things corporeal, that God is in material things, whether that material thing is, this is my God, that kind of thing, okay? In other words, so that he can really teach them. Um, I'm going to skip a bunch here, even though I've got a highlight. Go down to the bottom of that page. For this reason... For this reason, he was both born and appeared as a human being and died and rose again, dulling and overshadowing by his own works those of all human beings who ever existed, so that from wherever human beings were predisposed, from there he might raise them and teach them of his own true father. Just as he himself says, I came to save and to find that which was lost. Now, that last That whole last line that I just read sums up what's in the intervening paragraph, that part after the lover of human beings, because he's talking about people who look to gods, people who look to heroes, people who look to idols, etc. So he essentially fulfills all of those things. In other words, you want a hero? Look to me. You want a god? Look to me. You want a wise man? Look to me. You want a... right? Chapter 16. If human beings descended to perceptible things, that is, things that they could understand, the word himself submitted to appear through a body, so that as a human he might wince to himself and return their sense perception to himself. That he might return their sense perception to himself. In other words, that they would perceive him, would understand him. You know, um, Christ asks Peter, and I can't remember the exact context, but Christ asks Peter, who do you say that I am? And he says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay. And at another point, Christ asks Peter, and he says, you know, to whom shall I turn? You have living water. You have the words of eternal life. In other words, you know, yeah, I could go off and follow somebody else. But they don't have the word eternal life. For the word right in the middle of pay, uh, paragraph 16, chapter 16. For the word unfolded himself ever. 
love this language, by the way, unfolded himself everywhere, above and below and in the depths and in the breadth, above creation, that is, the universe writ large, below in the incarnation, in the depths, in hell. Well, how did he unfold himself in hell? The harrowing of hell. During the three days in the tomb, in the breadth of the world, everything is filled with the knowledge of God. St. Paul, uh, not St. Paul, the psalmist says, Behold, if I go down into Sheol, there thou art with me. Job says, Yea, though he slay me, yet my Redeemer liveth. Meaning that he knows wherever he goes, God is. So how widespread was the belief in the hearing of hell during this time? And yeah. Universal. Okay. Universal. I mean, they, <coughs> they accepted that as a dogma of the faith. Yeah. Okay. And you'll see... We'll see some of that in um, St. Gregory Nazianzus. And I'm trying to remember if it comes up at all in St. Ephraim the Syrian in the hymns on peace. I don't think it does. It does in St. Gregory, though. Um, chapter 17. He goes on, for he was not enclosed in the body, nor was he in the body, but not elsewhere. Nor while he lived, that is his body, was the universe left void of his activity and providence. Well, what is he talking about here? He's saying that when the word was in that does not mean that the word, therefore, was absent from the Godhead. Okay? And when Christ walked on the earth, it wasn't where, you know, you had a duality <laughs> in heaven. The Trinity was the Trinity, okay? So, my question then would be, like, does that not suggest that he wasn't full, he didn't become completely human? No. What we're going to see when we talk about, um, when we talk about, train of thought derailed when we talk about geez, Council of Nicaea and a couple of the other councils. You know, that's the point that um, sheesh. What was your question again? I got <laughs> little the, sleep last night. My brain the, is just... The idea that, that Jesus or that, that that the word was still present, you know, in the um, like was still omnipresent with the Trinity, right. the, and was not contained the contained fully within the human body. Does no, that because he, no, because he wasn't contained. God can never be contained. That's why you know he gets called. You know, in the language of the church, hymns of the church, and, and such. Um, you know the the. Son and Word of God, you know, fully God, fully man, but uncircumscribed at the same time. So that the, the language that gets used of the two natures, okay, two natures in one person, okay, mm -hmm. fully God, fully man, but not mixed nor confused. So that you couldn't take a, you know, you couldn't biopsy Christ. <laughs> you couldn't biopsy and find the God particle. Right. Because the flesh was totally human flesh, period. The spirit was totally God. <clears throat> well, it, it, and there were in him two wills. There was a human will mm -hmm. and there was the divine will. You know, but what Christ knew as a man, he knew as a man. That is, he didn't have all knowledge. Right. He wouldn't be walking around in no Einstein's theory of relativity. 
whether it's correct or not, okay? He probably, you know, when he walked up and down the, the lands of Palestine, he probably, from everything we know of first century carpenters, let's say, he probably didn't know Greek. He probably only speak, spoke Aramaic, okay? He might have known some Hebrew, some, but not like a Jew today living in Israel would know Hebrew, okay? Um, but he definitely didn't know, you know, Slavonic and German and Latin and all the languages of the world, which, as God, he would know, okay? But he also didn't walk around, because, I mean, imagine that, you know, instead of the Sermon on the Mount, he walks around and says, Gregory, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> and he could have played, you know, the whole parley tr parlor trick in Proven, okay, because of being God. He could have kind of done that, but he doesn't, all right? Um, so he goes on, uh, and as being in all creation, being in all creation, okay, he is in essence outside everything, but inside everything by his own power. What in the world is he talking about? Being in all creation, he says he is, in essence, outside all creation. Okay. Here is all creation. Mm -hmm. Everything made that is made. Right? And he's saying this okay, is God by his power. This is God in his essence. So, what does this mean, God, by his power? Okay? These are what the church, the language the church will later use, or the fathers will later use. The divine energies. Okay? Which is different from this. This is God in his godness. The, the very substance, if you want, of God. Whatever that is. It's, it's the God particle, so to speak. Right? These, however, are how God makes himself known. So, for example, being. The very fact that one of the proofs for God is the very fact that things exist is a proof of God. Well, what other kinds of energies or power, okay, creativity, love, justice, mercy, you know, in Protestant circles, these are usually called attributes, the attributes or characteristics, of, okay, but these are, these are, if you want, you can call them this, emanation of God. But they're not God's isness in and of itself. So every, the fact that everything exists, that is an element of God's energy. What is it St. Paul says? In him we live and move and have being. Okay? So that even though God, you know, if, if we take the Genesis account, even though God rests today, when he rests, he doesn't withdraw his energies. Because what happens if he does? Everything ceases. Exactly. All right? So, back to that play page. And as being in all creation. Okay, so this is God's energies. Being in all creation, he is in essence outside everything. We can never... This, God's essence, by, by looking in here, anywhere in here. That's why the Hubble telescope will never find God in his essence. Uh, he's outside everything, but inside everything by his own power. Arranging everything, unfolding his own providence in everything to all things. Unfolding his own providence. He keeps using that word unfolding. Which I really love, because when you come to think of it, what's he talking about? You know, 
it's like everything looks like this. And you fold it up until the, the clump of paper gets so hard that you can't fold anymore, or so small that you can't really see it, and what happens? You start to unfold it, and what happens as it unfolds? Not only does it get larger, but you see more and more and more. And as it were, we would just keep unfolding. Okay? This is Lewis's kind of, you know, farther up, higher in. Higher up, farther in, whatever it is. Further up and further. Further up and further in. I never remember that. Where the inside of Narnia is larger than the outside. What? That's where you go beyond reason. That's where it's a mystery. It's a paradox. Okay? So, uh, unfolding his own providence and everything to all things and giving life to each thing and to all things together, containing the universe, okay, containing the universe and not being contained. God contains it all, but God is not contained in it. But being holy in every respect in his own Father alone. Okay, here we're talking about the Word, as it were, who is one in essence. That word, I don't remember if I wrote it up here. I did my other class. Homoousios, which means one essence, right? Having the same essence. This is a term that people literally fought and died over. Okay, in the Council of Nicaea and later, homoousios. What, what Arius wanted to say was that he was homoousios. And that little E right there, that I, means one like in substance or essence. Similar, but not the same. Okay. Now, when you say they literally fought and died over this. Yeah, there were battles between okay. the, the quote unquote orthodox or right thinking, right teaching, and the Arians. You know, people uh, put out of the church. I didn't talk at all about St. Athanasius's, you know. Biography, but here's a guy who was a bishop, patriarch of Alexandria for 40 some years, and he only actually spent, if I remember right, about 15 of those years in Alexandria because he kept being <laughs> exiled, dethroned, brought back in, dethroned, brought back in, you know, um, by a variety of people. Okay? Emperor, I mean, he really angered Constantine first time. And I, I, I was doing some reading last night. There are some who, who do think that this was written around 319, when he would have been about 20. Okay? Uh, most think that it probably dates closer from 332 to 335. And one of the reasons that it's said that it's 319 is you never hear Arius mentioned. That is, you don't see the name Arius or Arian or the unnameable heresy, as it were. Well, does he really need to name it? No, just like Ignatius, um, for the most part, ignoring the Docetus. I mean, he, he mentions it a couple of times, but, but he doesn't like, you know, say, I'm talking about Docetus. You know, and, and, and here he's not saying, I'm talking about Arian. Because what point does he continually make? That it's for everyone. Who, okay. He's not like calling anybody out. He's Every point he makes, he makes continually. But um, <laughs> but it's God the Word. God the Word is equal to God the Father, which flies in the face of what Arian said, uh, what Arius said. Excuse me. Of course, he, he also kind of harps on the going against the Sure, sure. He, he, he does harp. Keeps coming back also that he was really physically, that he's really physically there. But his point about, you know, God the Word being one with God the Father is to emphasize that there was never a point at which, during which 
however you construct that language, God the Word did not exist. Arius, you know, stated emphatically, there was a word and the Word was not. I mean, they actually used, they actually had a slogan, like a battle cry. Right. There was a point when the sun was not. Now, did, did in, in, Arius, in Arianism, was it, was the word, so to speak, created, or the sun was, was created at the point of the incarnation, or no. did he exist prior? He existed prior. He existed, he, he was the first created. So he was created before everything. He's created before the angelic being. But in in Aries's conception, there was a point in eternity when there was only God the Father. And then God said, quoting the psalmist, This day have I begotten thee. Boom. At that point, God the Word comes into existence. And that is however many years before the rest of creation. But... At that point, there was a point before when he was not. Okay, And what the other fathers, the non-Aryan fathers say is, no, there was a never a point when the sun was not, or when the word did not exist. The word is co-eternal with the Father. Okay, The language of the creed is very God, very God, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, etc. Well, who's the by, true God of true God, light of light, very God of very God, you know, all that kind of stuff, which we'll talk, we'll get to at some point. He's Catholic. He, well, I mean, every week, you know, you say the nice he never tell you what it's about. Never yeah. explain. You just need to know it, but not know what it means. Yeah, it's one of those things that does does need to be explained. <laughs> and, and Raised on it. I have no idea. Maybe we'll try and fit it in. Um, <laughs> so he goes on. <laughs> Wait, you're gonna start adding things. He now? goes on page sixty-seven. Hey, we've gotten up, we've gotten ten pages. <laughs> Such was not the case. Uh, middle of the page. Such was not the case for the word of God in the human being. Why? For he was not bound to the body, but rather was himself. I love this language. Wielding it. All right. See, that was the language that that bothered me. You know it, about the because okay, it hold, was hold on. Like he became a man, and more like he was. Hold on, hold on just a second. Uh -huh. He was himself wielding it so that he was both in it and in everything. And, lost my place, and was outside everything and at rest in the Father alone. And the most wonderful thing was that he both sojourned as a human being and as the Word begot life in everything and as Son was with the Father. Okay? But we wield our lives because we would have to say, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong here. We are not solely our bodies, right. but we're the inhabiting spirit. Okay, And in the same way, he was the inhabiting spirit, but he wasn't only a spirit and the body wasn't a mere uh, tool because he really took flesh. And that's one of the distinctions, one of the one of the early heresies, I can't remember which it was, which it was, said that essentially um, it wasn't adoptionism. At the baptism by John in the Jordan, when John saw the Spirit descending as a dove, that that's when the man Jesus became the Son of God. That that's when the Spirit of God descended upon him. And he became the Christ at that point. Okay, the churches said, no, not true. He was the Christ from the beginning, which is why, you know, you shall call his name Jesus or Emmanuel, which means God with us, etc. So, um, therefore he himself did not suffer when the virgin gave birth, nor by being in the body was he defiled, but rather he sanctified the body. That is, because of who he is, as being with God the Father, he sanctified, he transformed the body. He raised flesh. Top of uh, page 8, sorry, page 68. When then the theologians in this matter, meaning the scriptural writers, 
say that he ate and drank and was born, know that the body as body was born and was nourished on appropriate food. But that he, the God word, present in the body, yet arranging all things, made known through the works wrought in the body that he was not himself a human being, but the God word. What does that mean? Does that mean that the 40 day temptation in the wilderness was all a sham? No. What it does mean is that he was both fully God and fully man then. In his divinity, did he need to eat? No. In his humanity? Yes. So that if he hadn't eaten, he would have, in his humanity, in his flesh, died. Well, what happens after he repels the three temptations? The angels come and minister to him. How do they come and minister? <laughs> they bring him food and bottles of water, probably. Okay. On 72, you know, he, he says, uh, Athanasius basically says that, that Jesus wouldn't, or at least from what I understand here, he, he says that Jesus wouldn't have been able to have a contracted illness. He wouldn't have actually been able to die of starvation. And, and that seemed a bit odd to me. Well, let me read this passage. I've got it. Uh... Like it says here, yet, yes, he hungered because of the property of the body, but he did not perish of starvation because of the Lord wearing it. Did he not then hunger? Yes, he hungered because of the property of the body, but he did not perish of starvation because of the Lord wearing it. Therefore, if he died for the ransom of all, yet he saw not corruption. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Fitting for illness to precede death, lest it be thought of weakness of him who was in the body. So, like it, Athanasius seems to think that the body itself couldn't have died of starvation. It, it couldn't have ever contracted an illness. Um, yeah, well, it couldn't have contracted an illness because of the nature of his generation. Or you could think of it that because it was the destiny on the cross, there was no chance that he was accidentally going to drown. Well, yeah, well, obviously. Yeah. You know, so obviously, obviously God would have protected him from illness. So then but but this seems more like, a, like that. But Ill, illness, illness is an aspect of suffering corruption. Okay. And it was impossible for him to suffer corruption because of how he was engendered. Engendered of the Father and Mary. Well, Mary was spotless virgin. If you read the Proto-Evangelion, okay, what do we read about Mary? It wasn't that Mary had an, had an immaculate conception. That, the immaculate has nothing to do with Christ. Immaculate conception right. is that Mary was immaculate from birth. When did that show? I know it was... Fairly, oh, it was late. It, yeah, was, no, it was 19, 18th, 19th century. Okay, yeah. Um, it where it would, that's when it was at least made a dogma of the Catholic Church. Right. Okay. There was a belief in the immaculate Conception earlier than that. Am I wrong? I'm thinking it's later than that. Um, about really placing Mary prominently in the Catholic Church. Oh no, Jones we're talks not. about and he talks about like 20th century. Yeah, I, I'm. Finally raised yeah, I'm. I'm almost positive that the doctrine of the conception, however, oh. arose in the late 19th century. But not for 1850s, 1880s, something like that. Still pretty late in the game. Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As far as the Catholic Church, yes, it's very late. In the game. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, the the early church fathers wouldn't have said that. Wouldn't have said that. They would say the early church fathers, um, Mary was sinless, but that she suffered corruption. Why? Because she was human, and she did. She was God. Never became God. Wasn't the wife of God. No. She was the mother of God. Okay. By sinless, what do they mean? Like she had never committed. A yes. Well, pretty miraculous. Well, and if you read, you know, if you read the Proto-Evangelion, you know, what, what happened to her? At the age of three, she's delivered to the temple, and she grows up literally in the temple. And I'm when I mean in the temple, I mean, if you think of what the Jerusalem temple was like, you've got the outer temple for everybody. And then you have the inner temple only for the Jews. And then you have the Holy of Holies, where she was raised, in the Holy of Holies that the high priest went into once a year, okay, according to the Proto-Evangelion of James. She was raised in the Holy of Holies and fed by angels. Hmm. Kind of makes it hard to sin <laughs> after that, 
But then at the approach, she leaves the temple, is engaged to Joseph, and boom, Gabriel appears. So that it doesn't give a lot of time for um, sowing her wild oats kind of a, <laughs> or receiving, I guess, that would be the feminine perspective. Uh, I mean, I'm not suggesting, like, obviously, I'm not saying, obviously, it's no, fundamental I understand. that she's a virgin, but I, I think sinlessness is a bit is a bit of a step beyond that. Um, I understand. And also, uh, says, "Don't be afraid." Which, okay, page. She's been fed by angels all her life. Page sixty-eight. Um. He was talking about the body ate and born and suffered, was no one else's but the Lord's. He became human. It was proper for these things to be said of him as human that he might be shown possessing a real and not illusory body. In other words, the docetists are wrong. <laughs> and so he cries out to the unbelieving Jews, If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, even if you don't believe me, that is, even if you don't like what I say, believe the works, that you might know and understand that the Father is in me. And then what kind of works does St. Athanasius go on and talk about? You know, he casts out demons. It's not a human work. What else? Purifies lepers, makes the lame to walk, opens the hearing of the deaf, makes the blind to see. And simply put, he casts away every illness and every infirmity from human beings from which anyone could see his divinity. Notice he does not go up to the hungry and say, be filled. I mean, the feeding of the 5,000, what does he do? He creates actual food. He he multiplies food. Yeah, he doesn't, you know, whoop, wave a wand and out of thin air, you know, fish and loaves drop. No, he multiplies. He, but he doesn't say, you know, oh, be filled with the Spirit of God and you won't be hungry ever again. No, he gives them actual food. Well, eating was something fundamental to human beings even before the fall. And sure. That's why they were in the garden. <laughs> Maybe. Um, well, I mean... According to... The, Fathers, yeah. Well, Genesis, I mean, they ate vegetable matter. Yeah, exactly. Genesis says you can eat these things. Sure, as long sure. As they were eating. Yeah. <laughs> For who's seen the body, page 69, I'm trying to get through much of it again. Who's seen the body came from a virgin alone without a man would not think that he who was revealed in this was the creator and lord of the other bodies. And who, seeing the substance of water being changed and turned into wine, would not think that he who did this is lord and creator of the substance of all water. If he could turn water into wine, He's got to be in charge of water. If he can walk on the water, which he also did, if he can raise the dead, what does that mean? He's in charge of death. He's in charge of death and life. Right. So you get this multitude of miracles, you know, each one demonstrating, St. Athanasius says. Okay, so I'm going to skip. Uh, shoot, I can't skip all that. Um, chapter 20. He goes on to talk about, talks about offering the sacrifice on behalf of all, that is, the sacrifice of himself, offers it on behalf of all, okay? Um, I am going to skip a lot more than I'd planned. I mean, we didn't read it, so. 72, that passage you had talked about. Um, yeah. The resurrection of the body in 22. Uh, chapter 24. No, chapter 23 at the top of page 74. Death must precede resurrection. Well, obviously. For there would be no resurrection without death preceding, so that if the death of the body took place somewhere in secret, death neither appearing nor taking place before witnesses, its resurrection also would be unseen and unwitnessed. He's talking about why it's necessary for Christ to die physically and for people to see him hanging there dead. It wouldn't be enough for him to be taken off, you know, and be hidden because what would happen? Oh, he wasn't really dead. He was mostly dead. I'm alive! Yeah, Miracle Max came from the pillar. So... Set page 75, right in the middle. Oh, therefore he neither endured. So, no, actually, before that. So something wonderful and marvelous happened. That ignominious death, which they thought to inflict, 
they, the Jews, what? This was the trophy of his victory over death. They used the cross to show horrible, painful death. And he says, this became the trophy over death. Well, why? Because even early Christians wore crosses. It became the sign of the victory over death. Okay. So, death is broken down. Top of all of page 76, pretty much. For what happened if he had not been crucified? Only upon the cross does one die with hands stretched out. Now notice what he's doing here. He's dying like this. What is St. Athanasius saying Christ does with his hands stretched out? Come. He's welcoming people. Therefore it was fitting for the Lord to endure this and to stretch out his hands, that with the one he might draw the ancient people, and with the other those from the Gentiles. That is, he draws the Jews, and with the other hands he draws the Gentiles. When I am lifted, quotes, when I am lifted up, I shall draw it on myself. Um, he goes on, you know, well, why did it have to be on a cross? Because it's only on a cross that you're lifted up in the air. I saw Satan falling his lightning and blazing the trail. He made anew the way up to heaven, saying again, lift up your gates, O ye princes, and be ye raised up, ye everlasting gates. Notice, he's saying Christ is the everlasting gate. And here's why. Where am I? Because we have God up here, and what happens? God comes down, and this is a gate. God comes down and opens the gate, okay? And we have Christ, and then what does Christ do? Takes back up. The gate's already open now. So be ye open, ye ever left, ye, be ye lifted up, ye everlasting gates. That is... Thrown wide open. Part of the idea of the harrowing of hell was that when Christ then went down into hell, he doesn't just go up and say, uh, Mr. Satan, may I please have all those who belong to me. The writings of the early church fathers put this pretty dramatically. He bursts open the gates of hell so that there are no longer any gates of hell. And everybody who wanted to come could come. And that now... Those who are in hell are only those who want to be there. There are no doors. It's not quitting. It's open. Now, and we'll have to stop with that. Mr. Satan wouldn't have been there anyway, though. Because Mr. 